Tritium, a short summary from the last video on why this isotope is so special. Hydrogen is special for many different reasons. Living organisms have hydrogen built into all of their molecules somewhere. It is the smallest element and hydrogen forms the basis for nuclear fusion in our sun among other things which makes life on earth possible. Tritium is also the only reasonably manageable radioactive isotope of this element. However, due to the diversity of hydrogen and the associated peculiarities of tritium, special measures need to be taken in order to handle it safely. So in our nuclear laboratory in Cologne we cannot do them justice and that's exactly why we are going to the specialized tritium laboratory in Karlsruhe. And what do we take a closer look at in this video? Monitoring exposure to tritium, preliminary experiments with other isotopes, the internal laboratory tritium cycle and last but not least the wipe test. Advanced tinkering took me there and the internal lab organization was done by Dr. Alexander Masteller, who also provided the complete knowledge input and just simply gave a fantastic tour. So tritium is special. Why? Tritium is a beta minus only emitter. It decays into the exotic helium isotope helium 3 with the emission of beta minus particles which have a maximum energy of just 18.587 kilo electron volts. This is laughably low for most people in nuclear chemistry. So there is no external radiation exposure from tritium. That's good, but it also makes things a bit more complicated. So you go through an airlock into the laboratory, which like all nuclear laboratories, is under negative pressure, so that nothing can go out. But you don't wear a film badge or a electronic personal decimeter. They wouldn't react to the tritium radiation at all. There's also no such thing as a classical contamination monitor as they also do not react to tritium radiation. Of course there's a bit of Bremsstrahlung but it's not worth mentioning. Now tritium can be quite nasty and you still want to know where and how much tritium is stuck anywhere because even if we laugh at 18 kilo electron volts it takes only 4.5 electron volts to break a hydrogen atom from ethane for example. The radiation from tritium still shatters every chemical bond. Even if the beta radiation itself does not have a long range the tritium itself unfortunately has a much higher range and can easily land somewhere via isotope exchange. Humidity means that a certain amount of gaseous water is always present in the air in a tritium laboratory. So we may have HTO instead of H2O. To check the tritium content a certain amount of air is pumped and ultimately bubbled through water. The tritiated air humidity then enters a gas wash bottle. The air must first pass through an ionization chamber which takes a live measurement of the tritium. This measures all forms of tritium contained in the air. This can also be tritiated methane for example. The air then passes through the gas washing bottle where mainly tritiated water is collected via isotope exchange. Water containing tritium is important for exposure monitoring because unlike the classical gaseous tritium compounds it has a very high bioavailability and therefore has a higher dose factor. It must be therefore monitored more closely hence the more sensitive measurement via LSC. So if tritium gas were to escape somewhere it could be measured by the live measurement at the ionization chamber and would later be confirmed again in the LSC measurement of the water. Yes, there was an increased amount of tritium. This shows 400 kilobecquerels per cubic meter. This is simply due to the type of measurement. Among other things the counting gas is just room air. You could fix it but it's a bit more complicated. Normally with radon we are about 100 becquerels per cubic meter. How is the air monitored and how is the material monitored? Heat of decay. Tritium itself has a specific decay heat of 324 milliwatts per gram. When you have your stuff that's contaminated you put it in a container like this. Now it takes 1 watt let's say of energy input to bring the box up to 40 degrees C. Now if there is tritium in it the decay in the canister itself produces heat and instead of 1 watt to get to 40 degrees C you only need 0.9 watts. That means we have a decay heat of 100 milliwatts from tritium 
and according to the tritium decay heat of 324 millivolts per gram, we have about 0.3 grams of tritium. That's quite a bit, but you get what I mean, right? If you were to measure the decay heat directly instead of the difference to a set higher temperature, you would be influenced much more by interfering factors. In general, you can see from the illustration that everything has to be very isolated. So much for the material monitoring. How about monitoring people? Since they primarily work with molecular hydrogen and we humans do not have a great H2 or T2 metabolism, the only way tritium gets into us is through isotope exchange or tritiated humidity. And then we test via urine and LSC measurements. Now we know how to check the tritium exposure in the laboratory, but you want to experiment with it. Only the special features of tritium mentioned above make working with tritium quite complex. Tarpir, physicists and their absolutely ingenious acronyms. So IR spectroscopy on tritium. How is that supposed to work? Don't you need a dipole moment for the infrared measurement to work? The bonding of tritium and tritium in T2 seems quite non-polar to me. Alex explained the whole thing to us in a bit more detail. Uh, experiment under construction, the uh, Tarpier 2 experiment, where we want to do IR spectroscopy on the radioactive hydrogen isotope tritium. To do that, we need to really increase the density because tritium as hydrogen is only IR active when you have either high pressures or in general high densities. Otherwise, you can't see it in IR. So in order to achieve that, we are uh, cooling down the gas in order to liquefy or even solidify it. This is what you can also hear in the background as a cryocooler to cool down to cryogenic temperatures of around 10 Kelvin. Tritium and tritium are all symmetric molecules, so in first order, yeah. they should not be IR active. You should not be able to see them yeah. in infrared. Yeah. But if you increase the density more and more, yeah. you get collisions of the uh, molecules. And the collisions make the form allow you to basically have some tiny multiple moments yeah. uh, of these molecules, which then allow them to break that symmetry and absorb IR radiation. For the experiment, you first need quite clean gases. So there is a filter system that sorts out everything else that is not the desired gas using cartridges. Now get this, at higher densities, hydrogen becomes IR active because we achieve dipoles via collisions of the T2 molecules. That means at some point liquid tritium or even solid tritium will exist in this apparatus. But not yet. For now we are practicing with 1H and 2H, i.e. deuterium. The interesting thing about normal hydrogen, 1H, is that it has a half integer nuclear spin as we might know from NMR analysis. Now there are two possibilities for the nuclei to arrange themselves in the H2 molecule, with symmetric nuclear spin, called orto, and with anti-symmetric nuclear spin, para. This is a kind of isomerism. If you cool it down now, para-hydrogen is preferred at lower temperatures. Only the conversion from orto to para is exothermic. This conversion takes longer and a catalyst is being investigated to accelerate this process. Here, fundamental research is primarily carried out on these isosmeres as autohydrogen and parahydrogen, for example, have different sound velocities and densities. The hydrogen isomeres have different spectroscopic properties and since it's a relatively simple system, many interesting quantum mechanical properties can be investigated on liquefied or even solid H1 hydrogen alone. If you go to deuterium, you now have a integer nuclear spin due to the addition of a neutron. And then you have D2 molecules with other spin configuration and tritium again has a half integer spin and it gets really interesting quite fast. So quantum mechanically, this hydrogen system of three isotopes is quite interesting. First, you practice on 1H and 2H. In the dissertation from Dr. Grösler, for example, you can see that the composition of auto and parahydrogen in the molecular 1H, the HD and the D2 molecule are different. We start at approximately 0 Kelvin and as we have just seen on this simplified diagram, we have pure parahydrogen. At higher temperatures, more orthohydrogen is formed. This is also true for the D2 and HD system, but you can see quite clearly that at higher temperatures, we have much less of the normal orthohydrogen. 
But we have other forms, well para hydrogen instead of more outer hydrogen, which are described by different rotational quantum numbers. And since I just said a few seconds ago that hydrogen is IR active, here is a infrared spectrum of H2. The x axis is between 2.5 and 1.111 micrometers, so near infrared. And what we see here is gaseous H1 hydrogen, which is gradually liquefied and solidified. For working with non-radioactive hydrogen isotopes, does not have to be clean or anything like that. Only when working in tritium, but it should be in the tubes anyways. Gloves are sealed from the inside when not in use, as the rubber of the gloves otherwise easily damages. Now tritium is used in such experiments. And then, 12 years half-life, that will not have completely decayed after the experiment, but it's still radioactive and expensive. The losses due to radioactive decay are about 5% per year. It would only make sense to recycle the rest. Blowing it out and buying new is just not an option. In general, losses are minimized because in the glove boxes, as we see here, there will not be any tritium in it. The system with the pipes actually containing the tritium, where science is being made, is called the primary system. And let's take a look what the recycling of the tritium of this primary system looks like. This is their diagram, but what does it look like when realized? Tritium molecules such as hydrocarbons are cracked over a catalyst and then are converted into an aqueous form. Catalytic oxidation is the technical term. This water containing tritium can then be captured using molecular sieves. Mole sieves are very small beads that store water extremely well. They are actually used in the laboratory to just dry solvents for this very reason. Here they are used to store tritium water and in their case they are made of ceramic to avoid problems with radiolysis. The molecular sieves are heated and the tritium water is then recovered. And the mole sieves are also recovered. So that's the system for the primary system which handles most of the tritium gas. But we have a secondary system around the primary system but still inside of the glove boxes. Pretty much a second barrier of which you can also recycle the tritium from it. And this is what the apparatus for the secondary system looks like. All of the glove boxes are connected to it. This is not pure tritium water in the sense of being T2O, but you still have a few kilobecquerels per milliliter. This tritium water is currently just stored, but there's also tritium gas, so HT, T2, but also D2 and DT and HD and H2. But we don't want that mixture, it should become pure tritium. We have now stopped the tritium atoms from running off into unusable forms, i.e. kept them back. And from this retention system we are now moving into the isotope separation. I rarely mention deuterium, but we still have a colorful mix of hydrogen isotopes here. This is done using a type of column chromatography. This is what this column looks like, for example, in a small scale. And in use, that is the right apparatus. What is used here is gas exchange chromatography. Yes, there are other ways to separate isotopes or hydrogen isotopes, such as distillation, electrolysis, or the sulfide girdler process. But on their scale, which involves a mere 40 grams of tritium, this method is the most practical for them. This means that the different isotopes bind to the column material to different degrees and then can be separated with varying degrees of ease, allowing tritium to be removed with 99% purity. The unused tritium is not stored as a gas, but as a hydride. And I think hydrides are really cool compounds. Hydrogen with a negatively charged, that's cool. We may know lithium hydride or deuteride or tritide used for hydrogen bombs, but what they use is much cooler, uranium tritide. Depleted uranium is used to store tritium. Why? Uranium is simply very good at storing hydrogen. In one of these containers, 11 cubic centimeters of uranium powder with a weight of 200 grams can store approximately 30 liters of gas. In equilibrium, the hydrogen or tritium pressure at room temperature is just 10 to the power of minus 5 millibar. From a few hundred degrees Celsius, approximately 500 degrees Celsius, the tritium gas can then be expelled again. The pressure is then around 7 bars. Uranium is cool, but it can also be kept in a zirconium cobalt alloy. When the tritium is heated up, it can be distributed via these pipes into the other glove boxes. But freshly recovered tritium gas can also be fed in vice versa for storage. Voila! A closed cycle with research, retention system, isotope exchange, intermediate storage and research. So now onto the last point. Are we even allowed to leave the lab? 
Obviously, otherwise the video would have been on YouTube, but maybe advanced tinkering contaminated his camera. So a wipe test is done with a polystyrene plate. You are supposed to cover an area of 300 cm squared. The 1.2 kg camera is picked up, documented and now wiped, assuming that we have an efficiency of around 10% here. And then hopefully no tritium sticks to the polystyrene. But why styrofoam? We know these vials. These are LSC vials. LSC, i.e. liquid scintillation counting, can measure with an efficiency of up to 100% for beta radiation. This requires a scintillation cocktail that produces a signal in form of photons in the visible range, which are then measured. And polystyrene dissolves inorganic liquids. This means that by dissolving the wiping material, 100% of the possible tritium present in the cocktail can be released and can indirectly generate light without the undissolved wiping material interfering with the measurements of the photons. And then you get a certificate confirming that Niklas can take his camera home. Well, wait a minute, we didn't get out this quickly, but we recorded another video on absolute fundamental research on the field of particle physics. That will be coming online soon. Until then, many many thanks to Alex for the really detailed to and the warm welcome. Thanks to Dr. Wendel for the permission to film in the labs and to Niklas for taking me along. And of course to my patrons for the financial support. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.